Welcome traders. Thanks for joining me for our IBFX Thursday live session. Today's topic, this is part four of our May series, is risk and reward. Now, this is a topic that I think really is one that is something that a lot of new traders have a, have a hard time with, they struggle with. I'll share with you my early struggles and how I be defined, how I determine what a risk and reward ratio is and how we define what risk is on a chart, you know, what that means without necessarily figuring out just, you know, I think a lot of people are, are, are essentially using dollars to assess risk. And while that certainly is part of the process, I'll talk about how dollars often can really become a, a hindrance because the dollars are the points in the game that we play called trading. And in many ways, we try not to think about dollars because we have such an emotional reaction and then all of a sudden our trading becomes emotional response to making or losing money when in reality it's a game of points. Okay? So we'll talk about that. We'll talk about reward and my opinions. Of course, now these are always my opinions, so take them obviously at that. I'm not here to tell you what is quote unquote right or wrong. It's just what I've learned in my my, my two decades of doing this. Okay, so as always, of course, these are simply my opinions and what I feel works for me. You take what works for you, you see if you're wired in that way to make this a reality for yourself. And you know, I stress I stress really understanding yourself because if you're not if you're not congruent with if your trading isn't congruent with the way you process things, you're gonna be fighting yourself and trust me, trading is hard enough. The market wants to land a hook to your jaw whenever it can. It's not personal. It just is the way it behaves. So if you make it all that easier You'll never make it out of the first round in my boxing slash trading parlance there. All right, so risk and reward. Before we get before I get ahead of myself, and, and by the way, it's, it's a it's a straightforward topic. It's something that does not, like the rest of trading, need to be overcomplicated. I'm not going to be talking about formulas and 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 looking at your account and determining how many lots you can trade according to your account balance and so forth. I mean, that's not going to happen here. I don't think that is a realistic way for people who, of course, in many ways are affected, if not ruled by emotion, can trade. And I'll talk about that as well. For me, risk and reward is chart and psychology, like everything else. If there's a, if there's a thread that runs steady through, through everything we talk about here each Thursday during our time here together, it's that. It's that everything is price and psychology. And price is our measuring stick for psychology. Each candle, if you will, on your chart is a, is a human being or at least a representation of human emotion. Okay? All right. So I mentioned I want to get a couple things out of the way here. And one is I hope that you all have followed me over to the Daily Forex Trading Edge. Okay? Um, I'm super excited about this site because it's, it's where I can, throughout the day, update what I'm looking at, setups, ideas, my overall commentary on the market, Daily Trading Edge over at the IBFX.com site. Used to be once a day. And we're, what we're doing over at the Daily Trading Edge is at least two to three updates per day. And, and I'd like to even get to the point where I'll do more. In fact, we have some kind of cool things in the works. I don't even know if I'm supposed to tell you. Um, but you know what? At the risk of, <laughs> I'm not great at following the rules, am I? At the risk of going ahead and getting myself into trouble, let me, let me tell you what I'm working on. Now, let me preface all this by saying I've still got to get it approved and all the other good stuff in terms of compliance and, and making the, the outcome a reality. 
But what we're, what we're thinking about doing, and, and you guys already know from our March and April series, I've been working very digital, diligently on the uh, EA for the grab. You know, how, how I can automatically or, or more in a, in a consistent way have a trend identification, go to a correction identification, go to actually a trade entry all through an EA. And, and you guys know that I've been working on that. That was, again, most of the March and April series. Uh, the daily Forex trading edge, which you see on your screen right now, okay, is an extension of the internal dialogue that I have with myself every day. You know, in my head, I used to write articles for myself. I know that sounds uber geeky, but I, but I did, you know. I mean, I'm an English major. Writing is kind of what I love. And I would literally write little articles for myself, write commentary and analysis for myself, because it allowed me to have a blueprint for my day. And eventually, friends of mine and, and Internet people that I met over the Internet said, you know, can I see the notes? And it kind of grew from there. But the, the Daily Forex Trading Edge is, is kind of my conversation with myself. Yes, I talk to myself only through Word, though. But essentially what I'm able to do is take these ideas of, of my observations of the market, the Dow, the dollar, crude oil, gold, the continuous commodity index, the pairs that I trade, and put together a, a viewpoint. Okay, because every day has to start with a viewpoint. Every day at some point, the viewpoint might change depending upon data and unforeseen circumstances and reactions to certain price levels, but every day has to start with a viewpoint of risk appetite, or risk aversion. Okay? So basically what the daily trading edge is 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 some of those are some of those articles. So for example, one of the, my discussions was what happens with 76 on the dollar index. And I went ahead and, and wrote up a piece regarding you know what happens when 76 breaks and 76 has in fact been broken. Okay, so the daily trading edge is one drop down. You can see the past articles right here on the right hand side. You can comment. We have a, a discuss um, or discuss that you can comment and ask me questions. Okay, we also have the market analysis, the market trend analysis here. And the market analysis is uh, written by myself. And also, I don't know how many of you have sat in to listen to uh, our guest speaker and also guest uh, commentator here, uh, Brian Kahn. He writes in this market analysis section as well. Uh, my last update here was uh, concerning the cable, as you can see here on Wednesday. Uh, we have a number of updates that are waiting for approval to be posted. That's part of the process and the regulation, I have to tell you, as far as being able to get new information out to you. It's not our preference whatsoever. It's just the rules that are imposed upon us. So uh, there's a number of updates that are out there. But here I talked about the uh, bearish directional bias in terms of the, the cable that we had seen. In fact, the daily chart had been, if you're looking at your grab candles, red. But what happens is sometimes we start to look at the daily and, and miss the trees. Okay? Um, and in this case, short-term intraday time frames, and, and like I said right here in the headline, don't neglect the pound strength. Now, obviously, when the market was moving sideways with, with more of a bearish sentiment and momentum, I'm not going to be a bull on longer-term intraday time frames like the 60 or the 240. But the intraday 15, the intraday 30, as I showed here, were giving excellent swing trades. And when I first shown this is when we first started launching on the 30-minute cable, as you can see. And then since then, we've corrected a number of times, not only on the 30-minute, but also on the 60. And on the 15, the 60 and the 30 were probably the two best time frames to take advantage of this on. Okay, uh, the 60 today for sure with that swing buy zone. So 
again, I just want to make sure you guys are taking advantage of what we've got at the Daily Forex Trading Edge. And I, one of the updates that I was really happy I got out there before the Swiss franc had a major meltdown, and this was back on Tuesday, okay, I talked about the franc's strength, in other words, the weakness on the dollar Swissy, and the risk aversion that it was, that was driving it. And for those of you that have looked at the, the Swissy, and I don't want to neglect some of the current market, but before we get into the risk reward, but this is part of the risk reward discussion in many ways, you know, understanding risk appetite, risk aversion. The franc strength, the, the Swiss franc itself continues to benefit from the fear. You know, I think a lot of people are looking at the dollar index benefiting from fear and uncertainty, but I think the real benefactor has been the franc, continues to be the franc. Broke down below the 20 period simple. This would have been the breakdown actually occurred on, on the 25th, yesterday, Wednesday. Okay, here's that chart the way it was. And if you scroll down, um, I, I talked about the, the dollar and how as long as 76 holds, it's going to be tough for the, the franc will still gain against even a strong dollar or a, or a supported dollar, but if that 76 level breaks, look out. And we definitely saw that acceleration to the downside today. Okay, and this was posted on Tuesday. So, again, we'll, we'll always have some educational commentary, but you know, and I hope you've come to expect it, because that expectation is what drives me to do this better and better which is I want to be forward-looking. I don't want to spend a lot of time discussing what has happened. You guys can do that. You can do that on your own. I, I, I think to talk about what has happened and the reasons why it happened, you know, really doesn't serve us as traders. It's great cocktail talk. It's nice to know, I guess, just from the perspective of having extra knowledge. But from a trader's perspective, it's all about how can I take current price action, set up a trade. So I hope, you know, I hope that's coming through. I hope you get that from the updates because I really want you to be able to read something and I mix in some fundamental discussion there too but what I hope you do is understand my take on the fundamentals and and how price action is reflecting the fundamentals and then looking forward how we can set that up for a trade and you know in the case of that Swiss franc it was all about the weakness that I was seeing on the franc that I thought was going to reemerge and it, and sure enough it did as we broke down through the, the 20 period simple moving average. Another chart that's doing that right now, it doesn't have the bias that Frank has, and I do want to mention this as we're talking about the current market. You know, in our live sessions, and I see a lot of, a new, a lot of new names here in, our, in, in the attendees today, so for those of you, and by the way, how, how many of you are, are joining us for, for the first time here today, just out of curiosity? Wasn't sure how many of you are joining us for the very first time. If that's the case, welcome. You're, you're joining a, a, a big group of regulars. There's a lot of, of the regulars here in the room as well, but you're, you're, you're joining a great group of people. Um, our regulars will chime in from time to time, and if you have a question that I haven't quite gotten to yet or seen on the, on the uh, question window, a lot of the regulars will chime in, and, and uh, they have lots of good information to share as well. So, like I said, you're, you're in good company, excellent company, really. And I don't mean me. I mean just the, the whole group here. Our community, our IBFX community just rocks. I'm, I'm super proud and excited to be part of, of that group. and and. Again, you guys are the reason I keep pushing to get better at what I do. So, being that being said, if you have a question, please feel free to type it in. The only stupid question is the one that goes unasked. Okay? So, type away. No charge for clicking on the keyboards. All right? So, I want to talk about the dollar yen because, you know, with that 20 period SMA breakdown, there is another view of that happening right now on the on the dollar yen. And what I was alluding to before is, you know, part of our time here every week is I want to talk about the current market because 
gosh, all this yakking that I'm doing, if I can't apply that to what's happening in the market, I'm wasting your time, right? Because you could be sitting at home or in your office analyzing the markets rather than me yak about things that have already happened, all right? But sometimes, like in the case of that Swissy, you know, you can see, okay, 20 period broke and the acceleration that happened through that. Interesting. Is there another situation happening like that right now? And, and that is happening right now in the dollar yen. But let's talk about the differences with the dollar yen and the Swissy. By the way, I do have an update about the dollar yen that's in the process, I think, of being looked at. And it should be live tomorrow. And you're going to get a sneak peek of it right now on the on the daily trading edge, a daily forex trading edge. Um, that should go live tomorrow. I've got two updates that are in the process of being posted. One is uh, what's happening with $100 barrel crude and the loonie. And the other one is the 20 period SMA and potentially a Momo play, a momentum play on the dollar yen. So I'll talk about the tools in this chart. And let's start factoring in some risk-reward discussion as we're going through this. And I'm also going to go to my, my chalkboard, if you will, a blank Word document. And we're going to talk about risk and reward from a psychological standpoint, risk and reward as, as it applies to particular entries, and, and how I feel you should allocate your, your, your account in terms of uh, position sizing, how many lots you actually enter a trade with, and how I actually do it as well. All right, so dollar yen. Well, first of all, we have to identify what kind of trade this is, because I can't even begin to talk about the risk associated with the trade until I understand what kind of market trend or market phase the trade is or, or the, the market is currently in. Therefore, what type of trading entry style I'm going to use and the strategy that encompasses that style. So we'll take a look at the dollar yen. We'll talk about the dollar Swissy. I got a question about that. We'll talk about that. And I got a question about the SMAs. Okay, let's talk about the indicators here on the chart. Okay, I believe Willie had that question there. What you're seeing on the chart right now is the 34 EMA wave, which is the 34 EMA, 34 period EMA and the high, the close, the low. The color-coded candles you see here are what I refer to as my GRAB candles. GRAB stands for GR. I'm sorry, GRAB stands for green, red, and blue. Very original, I know. GRAB candles. Okay. And if you want to download this plugin to run on your platform, we have the indicator available for download. If you go to Interbank FX. Let's jump on over to the website here for a moment. If you head on over to Interbank FX, www.ibfx.com forward slash tools forward slash grab. And I was talking about some of the things that we're in the process of setting up, and this is a good way to introduce them. Some of the things that I've been working on, as I mentioned, those EAs that we talked about through April and or March and April. Another thing that we're working on, and it, it kind of ties in with the daily Forex trading edge, is a way to communicate with you the actual trades that I'm setting up and triggering on my platform, Tr signals that I'm looking to, or, or setups that I'm looking to take. And I, I believe one of the companies and the programmers that we work with, uh, one of the ones that helped us with the grab, I believe, has a way to, to actually shuttle that through the Interbank FX Trader 4 platform, so you guys can see what I'm up to. So you can see my trades, as well as read the Daily Forex Trading Edge. That's one of the things we're working on. So it basically would be, in essence, kind of a supporting mechanism to Daily Forex Trading Edge, where if I'm talking about that dollar swissy back on Tuesday, and the trade triggers, and maybe I'm taking advantage of that with some sort of swing entry on a 30-minute, you can actually be signaled that. You, know, you can actually get that message right through your platform. That's something we're working on as well. And I don't know how that's going to manifest itself or, or if it's going to be something that is approvable by 
uh, you know, regulations, by compliance, but it's something we're working on. And again, it's all about transparency. Everything we do in IBFX, myself included, in terms of my trading, is all about transparency. I don't, you know, there's nothing that I'm using that I haven't at least told you all about. So you already see my analysis. I think it'd be kind of cool for you guys to see my trades too. You know. Okay, so you can download the grab indicator, which will color code your candles as well as put the 34 EMA wave on your MT4 platform, okay? Yeah, um, Mingyin, you ask about the triggers. You know, I think what will probably happen, and again, I don't know how we're going to do this, but, you know, if, I, if a signal comes out that I'm looking at a swing trade, you know, could I include a stop loss in terms of the signal as well? Yeah, probably. The only challenge is um, with, with doing that is if, there is, for example, if it's a situation of a swing trade, um, the stop loss, depending upon the time frame, will, will adjust with the wave. So maybe it'll be something like the trigger is the 34 EMA low and the stop loss is the 34 EMA high. And that way, the actual value of it will have to be, you know, obviously because it's going to change with every new candle, the value of it can't be posted with that first entry because a stop loss will continue to change. You know, situations like that, I don't know how we're going to do that. As far as profit targets go, those are fixed, and I, I think we could put the first one or two out there for sure. And these are things that I'm, you know, that I'm considering how we'll communicate these through the platform because, again, there are plugins now that can do this. So that's the plan. That's one of the things that we're working on for the next, you know, for over summer, the EA and then also a signals plugin. So, and again, it'll tie in nicely with the daily Forex trading edge. And that will definitely, I know the signals for sure will be available only, and I believe the EAs as well will be available only to clients. So, uh, that's something that I know will be just for you guys. Okay, so back to the chart of the dollar yen. Let's head on over there. Talk about some risk reward, and we'll get on over to our chalkboard as well pretty soon here. Okay, so what do we have here? And I mentioned, you know, that 20 period simple was a factor in the dollar Swissy. Well, how much of a factor is it going to be here? Let's balance out the difference between what we saw in the dollar Swissy and this dollar yen here. The dollar Swissy, even though it consolidated, had very much a, an established bearish psychology as opposed to what we're seeing on the dollar yen. That will absolutely make a significant difference in the way that we approach the likelihood for a breakout or breakdown. In fact, really the, the dollar yen, if you were to step out, not just on this daily, but step out to the weekly, you'd see just how, how much the previous Acceleration to the downside has once again, like it did back in January 2009, like it did back in December 2009, it's really starting to stagnate. But the weekly shows there is a dominant, the weekly, okay, shows there is that dominance of the bearish psychology. But we're trading the daily, right? That's where our focus is. I just wanted to show you stepping out uh, the, the amount of negativity that comes with this pair on a larger scale, but not on a scale that I'm necessarily trading. So while there is, if you squeeze in the market memory, while there is definitely a bearish bias that preceded the consolidation, a lot has happened to the dollar yen. Intervention, the earthquakes, and, and this overall very wide sloppy chop that's resulted at the end of what was a very organized move lower. So we're dealing with this slop now. We're dealing with this slop and current support of the 20 period SMA and a very short term tightening of the trading range. Now again, I've got the grab candles working here. I've got my 34 EMA wave working here and I've got a 20 period simple. Uh, another simple moving average I like using is the 200. Now I like having the 20 period SMA and this, and this applies to any time frame. Okay, the 200 period simple moving average. 
and then sometimes I'll even use a, a 50 period SMA, but my preference is for the two, 20 and the 200. Those I think are, are musts in terms of additional moving averages outside of my 34 EMA wave. Okay. All right, so I know that I don't have that overwhelming bias on the daily that I have on the on the Swissy that I do on the on the daily dollar yen. But there has been support along that 20 period simple. The weekly trend is down. Now, what are reasons that the yen could start to get some footing over the dollar index? What are some of the reasons? One would be the dollar actually slipped below 76 today. 76 double zero, major psychological level. We finally slipped down below that level today. And that level had been fairly decent support for some time. Now, this doesn't mean we're going to just see a complete breakdown of the dollar index. It's just a major psychological level that has been broken. And that is allowing the yen to gain against it. Okay? Now, the 20 period simple here, as you can see, could trigger a momentum breakdown. And, and the way I would confirm that is with a traditional moving average, which you can download from IBFX.com. It's one of the indicators that we have there, or you can just use the oscillator of the moving average. When it goes negative, it would confirm a breakdown through support. It's not the indicator that gets us in. It's the breakdown through price with the confirmation of a negative MACD. We have really neither yet. We don't have really a breakdown to the SMA. We don't have a negative MACD. So this trade is not triggered yet. If we happen to bounce from the 20 period SMA, which we could, and by the way, what else is nearby? What else is nearby other than that 20 period SMA? The 81 major psych level. In fact, today's low is 81.08. I have a major spike level factored in here as well. If I get a bounce from that 20 period simple and that 8100 major spike level, what could I set up? I could set up a swing if price is correct high enough into the resistance of the 15 or 30 minute 34 EMA wave. Okay? We'd have to see a little bit of a bounce, a little healthy bounce here. Could the 81 level, the 20 period simple do that? Sure. What else would we need to see the yen start to lose ground over the dollar? We need to see the dollar rally a little bit. Okay. What else would help? Well, if the dollar rallies, think about it for a moment. We could see the yen gain on, obviously, the dollar. But what is another thing that could help us other than a dollar rally? A Dow rally. Because sometimes the dollar yen will move with the Dow. Sometimes it'll move with the dollar. So if the if the Dow starts to show some risk appetite, generally speaking, what happens is the yen is sold as people basically use the yen, borrow the yen to fund the purchase of potentially higher yielding assets. In a sense, in essence, a, a carry trade. Okay. So looking at the reasons for what could be a yen bounce, those are two of them. I would need to see the dollar strengthen, so the yen would weaken against it, driving the dollar yen up. Or I would have to see a little bit of, see some Dow future strength or some, some Dow strength there. Okay? Right now the Dow futures are pretty flat. We're not getting an acceleration through 12,400 on the Dow major psychological level, and it's not triggering a bunch of buy orders. We're not getting momentum, bullish momentum out of it. So we're still waiting to see if traders are willing to do something like that. And maybe we won't see it. We're coming into Memorial Day weekend. Next week is non-farm payrolls. Maybe we won't see it. Okay? So in terms of, again, the 20 and the 200 period SMAs, excellent question here, and, and I'm going to address that right now. And that is, and this is a question from Ming Ying who asks, I thought the significance of moving averages as support and resistance is when they're, uh, is not there when they're flat. And Ming Ying, absolutely, for the most part, moving averages, including the wave, are excellent support and resistance 
when they are trending. They are trending tools. I absolutely agree with you. Um, you will not see me talk about the wave in terms of support and resistance when it's moving sideways. In fact, we're focusing on the 20 period simple in this sideways environment. The reason the 20 and the 200 are on my charts is because of their psychological relevance. I don't think there's anything magical about a 20 period. I don't think there's anything magical about a 200. But they are so well watched. In fact, if you look at some of the, the, the automated tools, you know, scanners for stocks and futures and even Forex, a lot of traders will simply look at the 20, a, a certain type of scan that uses just those moving averages. It's, they're very popular, psychologically significant, well-followed moving averages. And because of that, they transcend, I think, the indicator's limitation to being really useful in just a trending environment. And they basically become important in even non-trending environments because of their psychological significance. Okay? And you won't see me do that with a 34-period EMA wave. But I will do that with well-known, well-followed indicators like the 20, the 50, and the 200 period, especially that 200 period, SMA, simple moving average, across any time frame, but really applicable to the daily. Okay, very applicable to the daily. Okay, so thank you for that question. Um, yes, all the simple moving averages, William, are on the close. So thank you for that question. And again, uh, the SMAs we're talking about are 20, 50, and 200 period. All right. All right. So if there's going to be a bounce, what is my alternative to maybe a momentum short on the daily? My alternative would be a 30-minute swing entry. Now, part of my risk and reward consideration is understanding some of these larger support levels that I can't ignore, like that 20 period simple. For a momentum trade, my, my risk is essentially the opposite side of the range. Now, I could cheat it in. In other words, if I look at the width of this range and say, well, I, I may not be willing to take a breakdown through 81 all the way back up to, say, 82.20, risking 120 pips, on a trade that might simply be too expensive. In fact, for those of you that saw the description of our, our chat here today, you know, part of the description is, can I afford this trade? Now, affording a trade means that I acknowledge where the trade is no longer valid. For those of you that have heard me talk about risk and reward before, that's the point of validity. Let's go on over to our, our or chalkboard, if you will. Okay? Can I afford this trade? That means what I call my point of validity. I think the question we always have to ask, once we recognize the market phase, okay, which you'll also hear me refer to as the market trend. Usually when the market's in a bullish or bearish trend, I'll call it the market trend. When it's moving sideways, I'll call it the market phase. I don't know. I just tend to do that. So once we've identified that, that's really number one, right? Once we've identified that, that leads to step two, which is I can choose an entry strategy that's appropriate for the underlying psychology of the market. Okay? Each strategy has a point of validity. And just like the name implies, I'm asking myself a very simple question as far as point of validity goes. Where is the trade no longer valid? That is the heart of point of validity. Now, it's not a dollar discussion. It's not a percentage discussion, okay? It's not even a, a, a pip discussion, 
Okay? It's not even a matter of a certain number of pips. Okay? It's a discussion of if I know why I got into a trade, I also have to know where that trade is no longer because of price action reflecting or a good response to the psychology of the market. So let's take swing trading. It's kind of an odd way to describe it. Let's just take swing trading for a moment. This swing's probably the easiest example. Swing example. All right, we'll go back to that dollar yen for the swing example here. So I mentioned that 81 and the 20 period simple create a bounce. Because of the narrow range of the daily, I'm going to focus on short term intraday time frames because of the lack of range. So that means I'll look at maybe between the greens and the five minute. I'll look at the 15, I'll look at the 30, maybe the 60. The 60 is on the fence, but definitely not the 240. Okay? Those are my considerations. Having said that, I'm looking for clarity. I'm looking for which wave has a very clear angle, clock angle, then which one has a smoother 34 EMA wave. Is it established? And if it has been tested before, was it respected? In this case, we're hoping that the wave will be respected as resistance within the trend lower. Now, the way the yen sold off today, in many ways, the initial swing trade will really be a confirmation of the fact that this move lower can continue because this is not a trend. This is a cliff dive. Okay, this is not an organized trek back down the mountain. Okay? This is like, you know, most of us go to the slopes. I don't know how many of you ski or snowboard. I'm, I don't know how to snowboard, but I ski. You know, most of us kind of go down the mountain, and it's like a nice trend down the mountain. And then I'm sure some of you have seen those adventure videos where some very skilled but highly crazy person is going down the side of the mountain that we don't even know exists. He's usually getting helicoptered up there or she, and they're going down a slope, and, and you've seen these videos, right, where they just literally will jump and fall hundreds of feet from one ledge to another going down what I consider the back side of the mountain. This is what this was. This is that crazy but skilled surfer, snowboard, or skier, snowboard, or whatever going down the side of the mountain that, that a board in nature never intended. It's amazing to watch, though. I mean, these people are just operating at a whole other level physically and psychologically. I absolutely have a lot of respect for them. But they are certifiable, no doubt. <laughs> they are absolutely certifiable. But I say that with respect. Anyways, so the cliff dive, the back side of the mountain snowboarder here, drove the dollar yen down lower. This is not a move of organization in terms of a trend. Uh, it was very much an organized bearish sentiment and momentum, no doubt, but it, it, it certainly exacerbated. It certainly helped continue the angle, which I think was a 4 to 6 to begin with, you know, beginning to be a 4 to 6. It was already starting to look a little bit more bearish and bullish. It would be bearish, slightly neutral before the breakdown, before the yen really uh, stepped up on the, the U.S. dollar. So now it's a matter of whether or not we can get a correction and whether or not that correction respects the weight. If I know that my entry, initial entry, is the 20 period symbol for an aggressive swing entry, and then I know that my 34 period EMA low, the red line here, is my more conservative swing entry, okay? I know what my triggers are. I know where the trade is valid. It's valid. I know why it's valid. I know it's valid because of the bearish momentum and trend and sentiment. I've got red grab candles on a 4 to 6 o'clock angle. The reason that I can feel comfortable taking this trade is I have over the years come to trust the dynamic resistance of a 4 to 6 o'clock angle 34 EMA wave. Okay? So if prices pop back into it, my expectation is that selling pressure will overwhelm 
and it will move back down lower. I also know that if the wave itself is the reason for the resistance in my estimation, if we break the wave, wouldn't the, or if the wave begins to transition out of the 4 to 6 o'clock angle, okay, would it not invalidate future shorts and even potential and even the current entry? Now, if the wave transitions out of the 4 to 6 and I'm already short, I won't automatically pull the plug on the trade. But I will pay careful attention to where past resistance was waiting because that's going to be likely where I will be exiting the market. If I haven't already seen a hit to my profit target. Because if I've already seen a hit to my profit target, I'm no longer in a risk based stop loss position. I'm at, at best, I'm at worst a break even or at best a trailing. Okay? So if it flattens out, I'm just going to adjust accordingly to where resistance is. And again, that also depends upon whether I'm in a risk based, break even, or profit trailing stop, a uh, trailing stop um, in terms of the trades follow through. If the angle persists at four to six, we break up higher through the 34 period EMA high, and the, and the wave resistance is the reason for my expectation of lower lows and lower highs. By breaking the wave, haven't I invalidated the trade? That is my opinion. And that is absolutely my opinion that at that point, I have invalidated the trade. Okay? That's the point of validity. That's, it's not, it, notice I haven't even talked about pips yet, percentages, or dollars. Now, does that factor into our trade? Absolutely. You know, at some point within the discussion of risk and reward, okay, I have to understand that just because the point of validity is way up here doesn't mean that the trade is, is, is acceptable for my risk tolerance or even my account balance. There are, and this is a concept that a lot of traders have a very difficult time wrapping their heads around because it's really never been told to them. And that is, there are trades that you cannot afford to take. either due to personal risk tolerance or account size. And that's fine, you know. Every trade that triggers does not mean it's one that's appropriate for everybody. To think that is ridiculous. Is there a trade appropriate for me? Okay. That's so we have to know your own wiring. That's what I mentioned early on in our discussion. You have to be congruent with yourself. You have to know yourself and work within that. Otherwise, you'll be fighting yourself, and you will inevitably gut your account. You can't fight yourself and expect to be a successful trader, ever, for the long haul. Okay? So, in terms of how do I decide that? Well, that's a very personal thing. There is no formula. that will help answer this. And I see all these formulas out there for how many lots and how much risk and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, my problem with that is trading is not formulaic in terms of a trade happens and a newbie trader, based upon his account size, is going to take a certain amount of lots that he may psychologically not be ready to take on, or she may not be psychologically ready to handle that kind of size. To me, size comes with confidence. Confidence comes with success. Success comes from following your trading plan and understanding your trading plan. You guys remember, C plus C equals C. That's my, my formula <laughs> for psychology. And it's not even that simple, you know, but this is just the way I can remind myself of the steps I must take. If you have to use some steps, okay, to kind of keep you in the right uh, frame of mind, the right uh, 
thinking. That's fine. Okay, think about the steps that you will take. What are the steps that we're going to take? Well, there's, there's obviously the steps of comprehension plus, there we go, let me go down here. Comprehension plus confirmation equals confidence. Okay, that's, that's my way of reminding myself I must understand my trade. Okay, I have to put the time in to see how it works, learn to trust my tools. And, then, and as I do that process, I'll begin to have confidence in not only myself, but my tools. Okay? So what are the steps in terms of my risk-reward? Well, the first step, let's focus on the risk here. The first step is obviously the market trend to the strategy. Because a strategy, each strategy has a different point of validity. Okay? For a swing, it's dynamic. It's, it's, the, it's the opposite side of the wave from your entry. So in a downtrend, it's the 34 EMA high. In the uptrend, it's the 34 EMA low. We just took a look at a downtrend in the dollar yen. We talked about how the 34 period exponential moving average on the high is essentially the point of validity as long as the wave angle remains down at 4 to 6. Okay? The flattening out would invalidate the entry until the angle comes back, it would not necessarily invalidate a current, tra uh, current trade, but it would uh, make you adjust, reconsider where resistance is so that you can keep a price-based stop loss in the market, okay? So from there, again, there's that idea of can I afford this trade? Because maybe the risk for that 30 minute is perfect for some people. Maybe it's not so perfect for others. Let's go to that chart here. So if we are able to bounce up into the 20 period simple, some of you might say, Rangi, the distance from 81.29 to 81.46 is what it would be, is really not something I'm comfortable with. Okay, fine. You don't take the aggressive entry. Some of you might say, well, Rangi, you know what, I, I, I like the 81.36 to 81.46 to 10 pips. I can definitely live with that. What I would tell you, though, is if I'm just four pips to the major psychological level, my stop loss in this situation, my point of validity, might be the top line of the wave plus about three to five pips. But I would probably go ahead and use, say, 81.55 as my stop loss because why not use the resistance of the major psych level? I'm increasing my risk by a handful of pips. I can live with that. And I'm willing to take that extra risk to use a major psych. Some of you might say, Raghi, that, that's, it, sounds, sound, it sounds like a great idea. It's sound thinking, but I really can't afford that extra risk. I'll use the point of validity, not the major psych. Notice there are two levels at which I could consider putting my stop loss. But only one is the point of validity. The other one is using the major psychological level as another layer of resistance, only because it's about four pips away. If it was 14 pips away, I probably wouldn't be talking about it on such a short-term time frame. Okay? So what about my downside in terms of, well, in this case, downside is our profit. So when I'm trying to determine where my profit would be, potential profit, I want to factor in past support levels. I want to factor in major psychological levels. So let's put some support levels here. So I'm going to consider where we've been already and, and the chances that the, the, the bulls might be waiting there again. Okay? So I want to look at some near-term support levels that we've stopped at. So if I get short... Go ahead and I'll use a I'll use a uh, blue line for my entry. Okay, if I get short either there or at the twenty period simple. So what have I done? The blue shows my entry options. The green shows my downside support levels, which essentially are my potential profit targets. My red shows my, my potential 
uh, stop losses, one based on the point of validity, one based on the 50, 50 uh, major psych level. Okay, so considering the way the price moved, or may move for that matter, And again, we don't know what's going to happen because this is a this is a forward-looking setup. I need what? First of all, I need a bounce. Then the re otherwise, the rest of this is a moot point. So if I get the bounce, I can consider the aggro level, or I can consider the conservative level. That's why both these blue lines are here. I never want to be in a situation where I'm risking more than my potential reward. Okay. So this, this level right here, this first support level, may not be my first profit target, but I have to acknowledge it as a first potential hurdle to the downside. So for me, I may put about a quarter of my position at the 20 period symbol, very light. If we correct up higher to the 34, which is my preference for this trade, especially because of the distance, I'll put the other three quarters of my position sizing. So let's call it four lots for something for a trade like this. I'll put one lot here, another three there. And if you've got a small account, utilize minis. I think it's a fantastic way to go. Okay? So the 20 period symbol is certainly an aggressive level, but notice how it increases your risk. You have to ask yourself if you can afford that whether it be the point of validity or the 50 period simple, or 50 uh, pip major psychological level, okay? The other aspect is if I do wait for the conservative entry, what if all I get is that 20 period simple? What if that's the, the extent to the correction higher? I could miss the trade altogether. These are considerations. Nobody knows where the market's going to go. I have no idea. I can only identify support and resistance levels and increase the likelihood that I know where prices will either accelerate, stall, or reverse. That's why you'll never see me top and bottom picking. Okay? I can only see where prices have been, or I could use other tools to project support and resistance like Fibonacci, or pivots, or moving averages. But in the end, it's just a matter of identifying a number of levels at which I will make some sort of decision. That's what we have here. We have a number of decision levels here. Some are risk decision levels, some are entry decision levels, some are reward decision levels. So if I take this first entry, to keep a one-to-one -one here, I'm basically going to, if I take the 20 period simple, I'm basically going to look, be looking for uh, this second green line as an pro initial profit target, and I'll be using the, the point of validity. Because if I use the 50 period, or 50 pip major psych level, I'm, I've basically given myself an upside down trade. I've got more risk than reward. If I wait for the more conservative entry <clears throat> up here at the 34 EMA low, I actually then could consider this initial top level of support to be an initial profit target. Why am I so interested in that first profit target? That's, a, that's probably the most important level after a trade begins to move in your favor. Because the Initial level at which you will realize a profit, and let's talk about this for a moment because it's a concept that we've heard, but we've never really defined, and you know, I've never seen it defined, so I'm going to define the way I look at it. Everybody here has probably heard, never let a winner turn into a loser. Now, what the heck does that mean? Well, it, it presupposes a lot of things. It presupposes that we already know how we're defining a winner. So the first thing is we have to define winner, don't we? I think a lot of traders read that, read that to this day, and define a winner as the first second we cover the spread and go positive. The minute we're up one pip, I think a lot of people think, oh, I got a winner. I'm in the black. I don't think that that's the case. I think the area for me, the area between my entry and my stop loss and my initial 
An initial profit target presupposes what? That I have number a number of profit targets, right? That equals, to me, no man's land. There's nothing really going on. Yeah, I could be losing money, but it's within my wiggle. Okay? Yeah, I could be gaining some money, but it's within my wiggle. It's on a, it's on a level at which I make a decision. How do I know at what level I will make a decision? I go back to the work that I did on my chart. And I look at all those decision levels. Some are risk decisions, some are reward decisions, some are entry decisions. Okay? Haven't talked about dollars, haven't talked about percentages, haven't talked about pips. Let's talk about those real quick here. Okay? And then we'll tackle some questions on the, uh, the board here. And please keep them on topic, if you could, because that way I, I already have a hard enough time with, with going off on tangents. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about how we define a, a winner. All right. So, and, and also pips and dollars and so forth. All right, so a winner for me is when I reach... my initial profit target. That's, that's, that's a winner to me. Okay? Therefore, a loser, simply, is when I reach my stop loss. I think most people know what a loser is. But a winner is not simply when, the, when your trade goes to the positive. I think a lot of people do that. That's just wiggle. That's no man's land. That's why it is so important it is so important in terms of in terms of risk management, not just trade management, but risk management, that you don't get what I call uh, piggy on where you take your your first profit. Take your initial, I should say, initial profit out of the market. Okay? It's very important that you don't get piggy. Because if you get piggy, what are you doing? You're skewing the process that follows. Once you have a winner and you realize a profit, You take your risk-based, which is what? Your POV, right? Your point of validity. Stop loss. And you can begin considering moving to a break-even. Now, precisely when do I make this adjustment? The minute I take a, 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 a winner off, the minute I take that initial profit target, I want to go to a break-even. Because then I would be risking letting a winner turn into a loser. So the minute I hit my initial profit target, I pocketed some of my trade, I want to move to a break-even stop. And a break-even stop for me is about three to five pips. In the case of a short, it would be above my entry, and therefore in the case of a buy, it would be below my entry. So three to five pips above or below, depending upon whether you're long or short. I never wait for candle closes. And you will very seldom hear me say never because I hate really words like always and never. It makes, it makes trading and life too black and white. We all know that not to, be, to not to be the case. But I never wait for candle closes. It just, it, 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 you give up too much in terms of slippage from your trade plan to your execution. So I never wait for candle closes, which is why it's so important that I use secondary indicators like the WAVE or the MACD or the CCI to confirm the price action. That's how I work around that. So rather than the confirmation of a close, I'll use the confirmation of my indicators. Okay? So once I realize, and if let's say the trend continues to go in your favor, the market, the momentum goes in your favor, and we reach the second profit target. Remember, initial profit target presupposes more than one. Second profit target means what? Now I shift 
to or from the break even to a trailing. And that's where we all want to be. We all want to be in a situation where we're in a trailing stop situation. That means no matter what, we're getting out ahead of the game. With a break even, at least you're not looking at a loss on the remainder of your position. But once you get into a trailing, that's where everything is really starting to come together. And the biggest problem you have at that point is not letting the pig in the head take over your trade. Okay? So there is the setup. Don't let your trade go beyond a one-to-one -one risk reward. Therefore, where you enter will affect where you can take an initial profit target and which stop loss you can use. Do you get to give the market a little bit more wiggle? Or do you, get, do you take a profit target a little bit later? Now remember, the importance of taking that profit target later means you also shift to the break even later. Your winner is defined later. Okay, that could be both good and bad, depending upon the volatility of the market, but I'd rather pocket a profit when I can, not when I have to. So let's get to the pip and dollar and percentage discussion, because it does have a place. It just, I think it's, it's misused oftentimes. And this is just, again, my opinion. Okay, so after all that talk, what have I been using to make my decisions? Support and resistance, price, right? Uh, 34 EMA wave, uh, 20 period or 200 period SMAs. I've been determining the support and resistance in the chart, working within the point of validity of the trade, which means recognizing the dominant market psychology that I'm working with, right? A lot of people like a 1% or 2% stop loss. Let's talk about where that came from. That came from money managers. Who, who, who people came to and said, look, I'm going to let you manage my money. What's the worst case scenario? And the money manager said, well, worst case scenario is we won't risk more than 1% or 2% of, of, of your capital on a single trade, of capital on a single trade. Great. Now they can put all those hypothetical mumbo jumbos out there, okay, with that 1% or 2% stop loss. This, that's where this came from, money managers. I'm not bad-mouthing what they do. That's simply where it came from. Okay? Nowhere on earth is there a logic behind why 1% is all you should risk. Sometimes, maybe you should only risk 0.25%. You know, it all depends upon support and resistance on the market and what? The validity of the trade. You know, where in that 1% or 2% does the validity of your entry come in? Because 2% might be way too much risk. In terms of that single trade, if the validity is maybe 10 or 12 pips away, like it is in that situation with the uh, more conservative swing entry on the 30-minute dollar yen, right? Also, the time frame matters. A daily chart has a wider range, typically between support and resistance, as compared to, say, a 15-minute chart. Time frames do present risk because the more time you are exposed to a market, the more risk you are taking on. Generally speaking, risk in trading, by my definition, is simply being in the market. Five or 15 minute charts, due to their smaller term time frames, usually mean you'll be in that trade less. Hence, generally speaking, less risk. But on a daily chart, you could be in the, in the market for days, if not weeks. More risk, more unknown. Okay? So, is a percentage important? I think as an uncle. In other words, if you tell yourself, I don't want to risk more than 1 or 2%, it'll help you when you're looking at all your decision levels in the chart to determine which entry, which stop loss you could consider, and which profit target. It'll help with decision making if you have a point at which you know, that's, that's the ultimate pain, your uncle. That's it. So you may say as an overarching rule, I don't want to risk more than 1% or 2% on my trade, but that should not become the stop loss. Does that make sense? So I respect the 1% or 2%. I just don't want that to become my stop loss. The 1% or 2% will determine what? Can I afford the trade? Okay. Maybe it's a dollar level. Again, the same thing. The dollar level shouldn't 
determine where your stop loss is at, but it's a cap or a max to prevent you from gutting your account on one bad trade. Okay? It's your uncle level. Can I afford the trade? Yes? Same thing with pips. All right? I've seen people tell me their risk reward. I've heard this before. My, you know, my risk reward is one to four. Oh, okay. How do you know that before you look at the entry? How do you know your risk is one to four? Or I only take risks that are one to ten. How do you know before you look at the support and resistance is usually my question. Oh, well, you know, I risk ten pips for every, uh, for 40. In other words, I'll, I'll, I'll put a 10 pip stop loss in and I'll, and I'll look for 40 pips the upside. That is so ludicrous to me because at what, you know, why even look at a chart? Why even look at a chart if you've already figured out what your stop loss and your profit target is because you might as well just get in any old place because you're not even looking at past price action to determine where the buying pressure, I'm sorry, the selling pressure, the buying support might kick in. Another one of my favorite tools is the price movement range, which you can get through the AutoChartist platform. We'll probably dedicate a, a webinar to AutoChartist and that price movement range because what it does, it calculates hourly and then another 50-minute indicator as far as it projects, I should say, price movement. And therefore, you can get a better idea. Like a great example would be contrasting the U.S. overlap to the Asian overlap. You know, one of the biggest rookie mistakes I see is traders sit down at the charts, look at the volatility between 8 a.m. and noon Eastern Standard Time, and expect that same volatility 8 p.m. to midnight Eastern Standard Time. Twelve hours apart, a completely different set of expected price range movement, usually for a lot of pairs. Okay, and, but that we probably should dedicate to another, although similar, um, an, another another time. So let me tackle some questions here, and and we'll and we'll go from there. And if you guys have questions ever on my trades or questions that I just simply don't have the time to address during our live sessions, please head on over to Daily Forex Trading Edge. Leave a comment if it's if it's you know associated with one of the trades that I'm talking about on the website, and and we can get the dialogue going using the discus. Okay. Um, also, uh, Twitter. You can follow me on Twitter. I believe that link is available right through Daily Forex Trading Edge. And I think we have a Facebook page as well. I don't know to what level we've gotten that going yet. Um, but if there, yeah, oh, there it is. Okay, so we do have it going there. So if you, you want to communicate with me through that, um, you can head on over to Facebook and look at the uh, Daily Forex Trading Edge, and, and leave me a, a question there underneath one of the updates. Okay? And i got to make a, a point of making sure I visit that site more often so we can keep that. It's, it's relatively new, the Facebook. So you can uh, check that out. All right, so a couple questions here. Let's see. Uh, just bear with me here. You know, it's interesting. As far as the comment, as far as better to wish you were in a trade, uh, better to wish you were in a trade than be than be in a trade. Wish you were out. Well, okay. I, I think I got your I think I got your point there. And I think what that really boils down to is how uh, trigger happy or gun shy a trader is. In other words, if you're one of those traders that will revenge trade if you miss an entry, those aggro entry levels will be your friend. Smaller position, aggressive entry. If you're a trader that will uh, beat yourself up for taking an aggressive entry and losing, then waiting for the conservative is definitely going to be more congruent with your personality. That's where understanding yourself is such a huge part of this game. But, Alan, I, I absolutely understand where you're coming from, and I think it's really a, a personal call as to which will affect your psychology, harm you the most. In terms of, uh, you know, we looked at a, a number of different time frames in terms of the discussion. Remember, all my decisions will come from the time frame that I am trading. The daily is used for directional bias. The daily is used for 
uh, I think some of those key levels, like the 20 period simple or the 200 period simple that are just hugely psychologically relevant, the major psych levels. Uh, going intraday or jumping time frame is not something that I advocate, but I do advocate looking at the daily to get an idea of the overall psychology of the market. Okay, that directional bias that I bring up so often in our updates. Okay? But I don't recommend time frame jumping. All right? We talked about candle closes. Uh, one of these days, and, and Ming Ying brings up a great point here about ATR and so forth. I don't use ATR, but I know a lot of traders do. Uh, one of my firm rules is to not discuss a tool that I don't use. Now, if it's something that a lot of people are very interested in using, I will begin testing it, but I, I try not to speak on those topics, subjects, indicators, anything that I have no experience putting live money behind. Forget studying. I could study something, but that doesn't mean that I've traded live using it. Unless I've traded live using it, I will not speak on it, because then it's just really academic, and I don't know that it helps anybody. However, along the lines of using an ATR, again, I like to use that auto chartist price movement range because it breaks it down by hour of day, gives you projections, gives you a rhythm of or cycle of the market. And maybe as we're designing the June series, I will incorporate that because it's one of my favorite tools and it is a tool that is available to you all being IBFX clients. So I love that idea in terms of getting some sort of range. Again, I use the auto chartist calculation for that. So we could definitely do something like that here in the future. All right, I have run way over time, and I appreciate your, your patience with me. And again, I, I'd love to keep our discussion going over at Daily Forex Trading Edge, at the website, at the Facebook page. Head on over there. You can find me at uh, Twitter. You can get my Twitter right from Daily Forex Trading Edge. Uh, there. So, again, thank you as always for your time. Thank you for your thoughtful questions. Great questions here, by the way. Really good uh, questions. Oops, I want to, there we go. Uh, really great questions, by the way. So, um, a big thank you to, as always, Ming Ying, one of our uh, regulars here. Uh, thank you to Alan and Elliot, and Mark, George, Willie, William, Tom, Melody, um, Jeff. I think ID had a question there. Um, Donna, if I forgot anybody, uh, I apologize, but thank you so much. You guys make this time for me really enjoyable, and I hope it's as beneficial for you guys as it is enjoyable for me. Appreciate your time, and I will see you guys next uh, I don't know if we're going to see you next week or the week after. Oh, by the way, everybody have a safe and wonderful Memorial Day. Absolutely, please. Have a good time, but, but be safe. And I'll see you at our next session, okay?